Good morning. Thanks for joining our Bible study today. My name is Paul Camacho from Faith Baptist Church, South Metro. We're studying Elijah, and today we are going to begin studying chapter 19 of 1 Kings. We already studied chapter 17. We finished chapter 18 last week, and today we begin the study of chapter 19. And this whole chapter is about the failure of Elijah. We're going to look at the anatomy of this failure and learn something from it beginning today and you know maybe you've asked some questions uh, in your lifetime why believers in the past who were great giants of the faith people who have been used by God and yet they failed they failed big time even today we hear from time to time of certain uh, Christian leaders in our midst who have been serving the Lord for a long time and are great in their ministry and they fall. They just fall. We hear of scandals about money, about power, about even sexual sins. And we're not here to condemn them. We're not here to look down our noses on them. But my objective is for us to understand because if we don't understand deeply the reasons for failure, then it's going to happen also in our life. And you know, that's why God has recorded failures of His children in the Word of God, so that we can study them and learn from them and not to emulate their failures. And so that's basically the, the concept that uh, we will begin to study starting today. Um, again, the objective of this lesson today and in the succeeding lesson is for us to learn from the failures of Bible believers. And um, before we start, let's bow our head for prayer. Let's make sure we are in fellowship with the Lord and ready to take in His Word today. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your grace that allows us to continue to teach and study and learn the infallible Word of God that lives and abides forever. Something that is the only thing that's permanent in our life is your Word. And thank you that your Word reveals your plan, your character, your person, and gives us the, uh, the guidelines, the procedures, the way to live our spiritual life as your children. Thank you, Lord, for this lesson today. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us, make us understand, challenge us to apply. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's, let's do a review a little bit, for a little bit. Okay, in 1 Kings chapter 17, we saw Elijah's preparation to become God's man for the crisis uh, in Israel. Israel was in crisis. They were in economic depression because of apostasy, mainly idolatry of Christians, believers who turned their backs from God and went into idolatry. So we saw Elijah's obscurity and his humility, his preparation. He just came on the scene from out, out of nowhere. But in obscurity, God trained Elijah. We also saw his moral and physical courage during the first time that he faced uh, King Ahab. I mean, he told King Ahab, there's going to be no rain. God told me there's going to be no rain for three and a half years. And you know, he had the courage that we, we saw that one. We also saw his faith application uh, resulting to the passing of logistical grace test in the brook of uh, in the brook of Cherith, when when uh, the brook dried up, God still supplied food for him. And later on, also he we look at his faith application when God uh, commanded him to go to Zarephath, uh, uh, a country outside of Israel where you would not expect a widow to provide for him, but a widow provided for him, a helpless person God used to provide for him. So he passed this test. This was this were all part of his preparation uh, for the revival that God uh, will use uh, him in the near future. So also his faith was uh, tested uh, when the son of the widow died and he... Pray to the Lord, and the Lord's omnipotence brought back 
uh, this boy to life. In chapter 8, that's 1 Kings 18, in chapter eight, uh, 17, in chapter 18, uh, likewise we saw Elijah as God's man for the crisis. He was used by God at Mount Carmel to turn the tide of apostasy in the land of Israel, the northern kingdom, and to begin the revival. So the Jews, uh, uh, when they saw the miracle uh, led by Elijah, and saw the miracle of fire that burned the, the offering, they decided they chose to turn their backs from Baal and worship God once again. And you know, Elijah glorified God in Mount Carmel. He was a spiritual giant used by God. He was occupied with the God of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was obsessed with the glory of God. Remember we studied that? His main objective was the glory of God. He was preoccupied with the glory of God. He trusted in the person and the character of God, the omnipotence of God, the sovereignty of God. He saw the fire of God come down from heaven. So all of these things, you know, we've, we've seen as a victory and success for Elijah that God made possible. Now, however, Elijah made a huge mistake when he killed the 450 prophets of Baal because he assumed temporal authority that he did not have. There was no you know, procedure for jurisprudence and all of that. He just impulsively, because of the euphoria, the emotion of Mount Carmel, he decided to slaughter the 450 prophets of Baal without authorization or command from the Lord. We look at this last time. He assumed temporal authority. His authority was spiritual. He was given authority to communicate God's word to the people. Okay, not to kill the Baal prophets. And today we begin to see the, 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 the domino effect. You know that domino, you know? This main, this one big impulsive decision, wrong decision of Elijah resulted in his failure in other decisions that caused him to fall. Okay, so today we'll begin to see this, the effect of this decision. He went into power politics by using violence to solve the crisis. You never solve historical crisis by violence. And in a very short period of time, Elijah went from a spiritual hero to a depressed, suicidal child of God who abandoned the plan of God, the purpose of God, the mission and the ministry that God gave him, and even the people that God wanted him to serve and teach. Wow. So today, let's look at the anatomy of spiritual failure. That's the topic for today. The anatomy of spiritual failure. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 1 and up to verse 4. The Bible says, And they have told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. The first thing Elijah did in here, you know, it's almost like a, an impulse. He immediately told his wife about everything that happened. And we all know that in the past lessons, Jezebel was a very smart but evil woman, scheming, manipulator. She was the one who brought Baal worship from Phoenicia to, to Israel. And she controlled King Ahab. She manipulated King Ahab. Then verse 2, the Bible says, Then Jezebel sent messenger to Ahab after hearing what happened. By the way, she's so smart. She was not present at Mount Carmel because she probably might have an idea that uh, the Baal prophets would be defeated and she, she doesn't want to lose face. You see, evil people are like that. They put you in front, you know, to 
suffer the consequences when the brains of this whole thing is Jezebel. Okay, but she's, she's very evil and smart. Now, after hearing the report from his, her husband, this is what she did. Verse 2, Then Jezebel sent messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also. So let the gods do to me, and more so. This is like a, a, um, an expression, okay? A curse. A curse formula in, in, in the Hebrew language. Um, if I do not make your life, as the life of one of them, one of the prophets of Baal. By tomorrow, about this time. It's very specific. In fact, she was, she, she was saying, Elijah, about this time tomorrow, you are a dead man. You will be like the prophets that you killed. Wow. Now, we're going to look at that because threats... Death threats, they, they, they are a weapon of the criminals, the evil people. We're going to look at that in a while. Now, when Elijah heard this messenger, the message from Jezebel, verse 3, and when he, Elijah, saw that, the word saw, you know, in the Hebrew, has a connotation of fear. When he saw, when he heard the threats, he became afraid. You know, in other translations of the Bible, it says, and Elijah became afraid. So, when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to, to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, okay, the southern kingdom, this is about 100 miles more or less distant. And he left his servant there. This is the servant. This is the son of the widow, uh, as per the scholars. This is the same servant that, remember last week, went up to the mountain seven times to, to, to look at the clouds if there was a, an evidence of rain. He abandoned his servant there. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness on, on the desert and came and sat down under a juniper tree. Juniper tree is actually a broom tree. It does not have leaves. Okay, we'll look at that last time. I mean, why, sat, why sit down under a tree that, have, that has no leaves? And he prayed that he might die. And said, actually in the Hebrew, this is imperative in the imperative mood. He actually commanded God, ordered God to kill him. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I am no better than my father's. Wow. Let's look at some principles, okay? Number one, the real ruler is not the one who has the position or the title, but the one who manipulates and influences the ruler. You agree with that? The real ruler in Israel was Jezebel, not King Ahab. It's the same in, in our country, in many countries of the world. Whoever controls the ruler is the real ruler. Remember that. Number two principle here, uh, item. King Ahab was courageous in battle, but his leadership was neutralized by arrogance, lack of character, pettiness, and self-centeredness, which made him weak and vulnerable to manipulation. I mentioned in the past stories Related to King Ahab. Remember Naboth's vineyard? He, you know, he wanted it. He was so arrogant and petty. And weak in character. You know when somebody is arrogant, you can manipulate him. You can flatter him. 
and then manipulate him or her. This is exactly what happens to King Ahab. So remember, I already mentioned the word arrogance because next week we're going to go up to a detailed study of the doctrine of arrogance. Point three, Jezebel's brand of arrogance, however, is different. It involved conspiracy arrogance. Conspiracy. Um, case in point, the, the death of Naboth was a conspiracy of Jezebel. Here, it's a conspiracy. He wanted to threaten Elijah in order for Elijah to run away. Power lost. She had tremendous power lost. Authority arrogance. Criminal arrogance. Remember, he killed so many prophets of the Lord. She's a criminal. Vindictiveness or vengeance. She's very, she, Jezebel was very smart, but a very evil woman. Let's go point by point. A, if Jezebel wanted to kill Elijah, she would have sent an assassin, not a messenger. You agree with me? If she, if she wanted to kill Elijah, she would have sent assassins to kill Elijah. But you see, he did not, she did not really want to kill Elijah because that would make Elijah a martyr. She would make him a martyr or a hero if she killed him. Her objective was to make Elijah go away and discredit him to thwart the revival in Israel. Therefore, she used death threat as a means to do this. If Elijah succumbed to the threat, and he did, and ran away, he would be separated from the people. Remember the people at Mount Carmel? <clears throat> Elijah should have started right away teaching them. But he would be separated because he ran away. He would be separated from the people who would then become disillusioned against him. Which was exactly what happened. So you understand, he, uh, you, you see her genius. <laughs> she just wanted Elijah to go away. To remove him from the scene. So that the, the, the revival would stop. Now, threats or intimidation is often used by evil people and or criminals to do the following. Number one, to stop someone from doing the right thing. You know, people use threats to stop you from doing the right thing. Number two, to remove someone who is a hindrance to their evil works or schemes. So people also use threats to remove somebody. In my work, in my work, in my professional work, I am no stranger to death threats. Many, many years. Because I investigate corruption in companies. I investigate fraud in companies. I would always get those from the text, from calls. Why, why, why do they threaten me? Because I am about to discover what the criminal acts that they're doing. And they, they, they hate that. So criminals would threaten you. And if you stop, then they become, they win, okay? Number three, to stop someone from exposing evil activities and crime and so on. So those are the uses of death threats. And, and, and Jezebel is using that here to Elijah. <clears throat> Point four, when Elijah got the message of threats from the messenger of, of Jezebel, he immediately became afraid. The Bible says he ran for his life. He ran for his life. Fear and panic neutralized Elijah's application of God's promises. Listen. When a sudden disaster or crisis or threat comes in your life, the tendency for you and me is to become fearful. And to panic and to become anxious he ran for his life fear and panic neutralized Elijah's application of God's promises or doctrines 
suddenly self-preservation became his main concern. Watch out! Self-preservation! And that's why he ran away and escaped. Because suddenly, his life became more important to him than God. Than God's plan and God's purpose. Now, let's see some observation here. First of all, Elijah went from courage in Mount Carmel to cowardice. He became a coward overnight. Wow. B, he went from occupation with the Lord. Remember? Just two days ago, he was occupied with the Lord, with the glory of the Lord in Mount Carmel. So he went from that to preoccupation with self. Now he is self-centered. He focusing, he's focusing now on self instead of the Lord. Be careful. This is a trap for all of us. If we lose focus on the Lord, naturally we focus on self or on the things around us. So he thinks, he thinks of Jezebel who wanted to kill him. He thinks of himself maybe imagining that he's already dead. See, he switched from thinking truth or doctrine or principles of the Word of God to emotional reaction. See, fear and panic are emotional reaction. And when you are emotional, you stop thinking. When you are emotional, you cannot apply truth from the Word of God. Underline that principle. Remember that principle. Because fear will always neutralize truth in your soul. He abandoned the faith rest application in lieu of fear and panic. Remember, we studied faith rest. Step number one of faith rest, claim a promise to, to stabilize your mind. God works all things together for good. Fear not thou, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Those are promises that stabilize your mind right away. When, there is, when, when a sudden crisis happens to you. But Elijah abandoned that. He had that in Zarephath. He had that at the brook Cherith. He had that when he faced King Ahab. He had that at Mount Carmel. But suddenly, he fails to apply. He, he abandoned any sense of responsibility and honor by abandoning his servant. <clears throat> When leaders fail, they abandon the people who serve them. When leaders become carnal and reversionistic and become arrogant, they don't value the people who serve them, their partners. This is exactly what happened to Elijah, his assistant, the one who served him. In Mount Carmel. So, here's a point I want you to remember. The main reason. What is the what is the main reason why all of these things happen? Arrogance. Arrogance or pride. We're gonna we're gonna look at the doctrine of pride or arrogance next week. But for now, I'm just making a summary of this passage. And looking at the, some of the principles here. Elijah went from total humility to arrogance. Overnight. And folks, it destroyed him. You know that it's the same way with David, with Moses, with Peter. Those great believers of the past. And we're going to look at them later on. When we become proud and arrogant, when we focus on self suddenly, it trips us. 
and we abandon the character of God, we abandon the plan of God, we abandon the attributes of God, the purpose of God, the ministry of God. Suddenly self becomes our focus. Elijah ran and went to, Be to Beersheba, uh, which is a distance of about 100 miles, more or less. Okay? 100 miles. Ang layo nun, one day. Because Elijah was physically fit. <laughs> the whole time that he was running, he was scared. And here's my observation. While he was running and scared, there was not a single thought of the Lord Jesus Christ. The God of Israel. No single thought. He, running for a hundred miles, you never think of Jesus Christ. You did not stop and say, what, what am I doing? Why, why am I running away? I am God's servant. I belong to the God of the universe. Why am I running away? He could have stopped, right? But no, he could not apply the promise. He was just consumed with fear as he was running away. Here's a principle. Fear and faith are, are, are mutually exclusive. Fear and faith are mutually exclusive. You cannot have one. You cannot have them together. When you have faith, you have no fear. And when you are afraid, you don't apply faith. So fear neutralizes your ability to think Bible promises and Bible doctrines. Wow, it short circuits your thinking. If there is one lesson you need to learn today, you and I, is to avoid or to overcome fear in our life. What are you afraid of today? What are you afraid of? Is there anything that scares you? Maybe you are scared financially. Your, your finances are low. Maybe someone is threatening you. Maybe you are afraid you are about to lose someone, a loved one. Yesterday I had the privilege of speaking at the funeral service of Ber Bernice Marcelino who, who passed away on February 1. And some of the members of Faith Baptist Church were there. And I showed, I showed a video of Bernice when she was at the Asian hospital can find their singing. It is well with my soul, smiling. In fact, when I visited her, I told the group yesterday, Bernice knew he was about to die. And she just asked me, Kuya Paul, can you speak at my funeral? I mean, no hint of fear, no panic, no anxiety. She looked death right in the eyes. She's occupied with the Lord, the Word of God in her soul. She, no fear of death because she could think about God and about the Word of God. Are you afraid of death? Maybe that's, 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 that's the thing that scares you today. Don't be because we have promises from the Word of God. Point four, fear is a sin, right? Fear is a sin. Panic is a sin. <clears throat> Worry is a sin. Therefore, Elijah was out of fellowship with the Lord by being afraid. Okay? When you're afraid, it takes you out of fellowship with the Lord. You need to confess fear and claim a promise. That's the way you handle it. Confess it to the Lord and replace it with promises. When you are out of fellowship with God, you will have the human viewpoint. You see, because you are out of the atmosphere or the environment of the feeling of the Spirit, now you, you, you try to solve your problem with human viewpoint. Not divine viewpoint. So what did Elijah do? What, did he, what was he thinking? The combination of tremendous inner stress. And by the way, stress is what we do to ourselves. Adversity is what circumstances and people <clears throat> do to us. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Jezebel's thinking and action, Elijah could not control that, right? He has no control over that. Just like you, you and I have no control over what circumstances do to us. But stress is optional, folks. You decide to stress yourself. And when you, and when you decide to stress yourself, you succumb to the pressures of life. It's going to destroy your spiritual life. As it did Elijah. So the combination of tremendous inner stress and the physical exhaustion of Elijah running for 100 miles brought him to a breaking point. Maybe some of you, you're approaching a breaking point in your life. You have so much stress. You have so much pressure bearing upon you. There is a solution. You don't have to be, you don't have to fall apart. Because God's word is the solution to the crisis in your life. Application of God's word. So, breaking point. What did he do? Point A, he ordered or commanded God to kill him. Lord, I have enough. This is enough. Just kill me. And again, the Hebrew is in the imperative mood, meaning he ordered God. That's blasphemy. He blasphemed God by commanding God, ordering God to kill him. Wow. B, he becomes totally irrational. You see, when you become arrogant, you become irrational. He escaped from Jezebel to avoid death. That's the main reason why he's running away. He's a, he doesn't want to die, right? But now he's asking God, Lord, kill me. Irrational. See, here's a principle. Self-pity is one of the worst forms of arrogance. If you have self-pity, you are arrogant. Because self-pity is total subject subjectivity. It's looking inward all the time. You, you, you're just focused on your own little world, your life. What the people has, uh, have done to you or circumstances have done to you. It's subjective arrogance. It's preoccupation with self. Another thing that he does here, the Bible says, he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life because I am no better than my ancestors or my fathers. So here he wrongly compares himself with his ancestors. This refers to the Exodus generation, by the way. This is another expression of arrogance, comparing ourselves with others. He's divorced from reality. Why should he compare himself with, 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 with his ancestors? God has a plan for him. He's different. He has a different ministry. He has different gifts. Who is the standard for our, for, our, for our ministry? What is the standard for our ministry? God. God's standards. We compare ourselves to God's standards, not to other people. But because he's subjective and he's focused on himself, which is arrogance, he compares himself with his ancestors. Now, let's see if we can learn... Two or three principles that will help you this morning. Number one, arrogance will change us overnight from greatness to failure, from being used by God to being a nobody spiritually. Arrogance will destroy us, folks. Arrogance destroyed the greatest creature that came from the hand of God, Lucifer. Arrogance is the original sin of Satan, the original sin of our forefathers, Adam and Eve, arrogance. We need to be aware of that. And I hope this lesson will help you become more aware of arrogance in our life. All of us are vulnerable to some kind or some form of arrogance. Some are just subtle. Don't tell me, you say, oh, I'm the most humble person. You saying you are the most humble person on earth, that is already arrogance. Right? Because let's be careful, folks. We can succumb to arrogance at any time. Point number two, fear will neutralize, okay? Fear will neutralize our occupation with the Lord and application of His Word and His promises. That's what fear will do to you and me. 
We lose track of the Lord and we focus on self. Point three. Here are some promises that Elijah could have applied because these promises were already available to him. For example, in Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, he could have applied this. He knows about Moses. He knows about the Exodus. He mentioned his ancestors, the Exodus generation. When this generation was crossing the Red Sea and their lives were threatened by Pharaoh and his army, what did Moses say? Exodus 14, 13. Moses said to the people, they were about to be annihilated by the army of Pharaoh at that time. What did Moses say? Do not be afraid. Stand still or relax. Stay put and see the deliverance of the Lord, which, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. Elijah could have realized when Jezebel threatened him that God will fight for him. God has already fought for him. He's still alive. God has a plan for him. He must have realized, you know, he should have realized that if it's God's time for him to die, then he will die. If it's not God's time for him to die, then just nothing Jezebel can do to kill him. It's a simple principle, but it's very powerful. So he could have applied that, 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 that principle, that promise. Another promise that Elijah could have applied in this situation is Deuteronomy 31.8. Again, the Bible says, and Joshua, this is the encouragement of, of Moses to, Elijah, to, to, to Joshua, his replacement. And the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Don't panic. Don't look around you and panic. Because the Lord, it is He who goes before you. He goes ahead of you and He goes with you. You see that? He go, he, he, he is... He's your point, but at the same time, He goes with you. He's not just your point, He goes with you. But today as a church as believer, God lives in you. See? God is not just with you, He is in you. Greater is He who is in me than He who is in the world. Wow, that one promise alone should make you relax and trust God. And avoid fear and panic in your life. Point four, some rationals. When we say rational, it's an explanation. When you face a crisis, there is an explanation of doctrine or truth from the word of God. There is an organized way to think. For example, <clears throat> the rationals that we studied here in the series of Elijah. Go back to the past lessons. I taught you this. The essence of God rational or the attributes of God. Elijah could have applied in his mind, the, the rationale of the essence of God. For example, God is sovereign. Therefore, he is more powerful than Jezebel. Amen? He's more powerful than Jezebel. Jezebel and, and King Ahab were powerful, but not, not as powerful as God. God could overrule them. B, God is perfect righteousness and justice. He is absolutely fair. God is fair to Elijah. He can never be unfair because he is perfect justice. And perfect righteousness. He cannot make a mistake. God does not make a mistake. You see, He's perfect righteousness. See, God is omnipotent. He is more powerful than Jezebel. And he, is, he has power to deliver Elijah from danger. See, Elijah should have realized that. God is omniscient. He knows all the facts. He, in fact, he knew about the threat of Jezebel. Billions and billions and billions and billions of years ago. And he already provided solution for that. He already provided security and protection for Elijah. You see? Because God is omniscient. What he knows now, he has always known from eternity past. Now, apply that to your situation. God knows everything that you're suffering right now. Every, 
every suffering, every adversity, every, every heartache, every difficulty in your life, God knows. Billions of years ago, and He's provided for you. You should not fear or panic. You should apply this, His essence in your situation right now. God is only present. He is with Elijah at all times. Therefore, His constant presence means He is provided and cared for at all times. The very presence of God with Elijah means that He is secure. And then lastly, God is love. God loved and cared for Elijah all throughout his life. Why would it stop now when Jezebel is trying to threaten him? You see, that is rational. That is thinking truth. That is thinking about the attributes and the character of God, which is so key to our happiness when we are facing adversity. This is so key to our stability, to our impact, to our relaxed mental attitude when we face any kind of crisis in life. We will continue this lesson next Sunday. Stay with me. I'm excited to uh, continue with these principles. We're going to resume next Sunday. I want to devote uh, this last few minutes of our lesson today to those of you out there who have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. He died for you on the cross of Calvary. He paid for all your sins. And the Bible says, Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. You can have eternal life right now. You can be sure of going to heaven this morning. What do you need to do? Just follow what the Bible is saying. Believe. Faith. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And when you do that, that is the moment of eternal life for you. Instantly, God can give you eternal life. That's what His Word is saying. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word today, for the challenges. May we not be may I be afraid and, and panic and have anxiety and worry, but apply your promises, Lord, starting this week, starting today. Apply your promises. Thank you for the lesson we learned from Elijah today. May we continue to be positive toward your word and hunger for your word for our own personal growth and glorification of thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching and see you next week. The doctrine of arrogance and the interlocking systems of arrogance. Bye-bye.